Greetings and salutations everyone, welcome to Bubble Hearthing, I'm Bubble, and today we're going to be talking about the white cards from Theros Beyond Death, largely from a standard gameplay standpoint, although I could address, you know, if a card seems like it's going to be really strong in Modern or Pioneer, which is kind of almost the same thing, um, you know, in other formats, as well as Limited, I'm not so great with Limited, so whenever I say something about Limited, take it with a grain of salt, take it however you will, um, I feel like I'm a little more adept at rating cards for standard play. Without further ado, here we go. We're going to see if White got something decent, because uh, in the past few sets, they got nothing. Just bad. Okay, so without further ado, we have Alicid of Life's Bounty, a 1-mana one 1-1 one -one with a lifelink. So 1-mana one 1-1 one -one lifelink isn't all that interesting. The only thing you could really see this, like, so usually you have Healer's Hawk, which is a 1-mana flyer with lifelink, and a 1-1, one -one, you know. It's the same thing with flying, which is just a better ability, right? So... In order to make up for that, what do we have? Pay one, sacrifice this thing, target creature or an enchantment you control. Gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn. Worth noting, just going forward, because a few more protection things. Protection does not protect against board wipes such as Kaya's Wrath or Planar Cleansing or any sort of just blanket removal things. Um, it will protect you against Deafening Clarion or there's like that red one that deals 4 damage to everything that's coming up. So it will save you from that. But... You know, Wrath effects don't actually um, care about protection, I'll say. So how does this scale up? In Limited, this is bad, because you're probably not going to be able to use the effect to much of your advantage. Um, and in Constructed, in Standard Play, there is a chance that there's going to be a potentially strong... <laughs> There is the potential for there maybe to be a deck <laughs> that is a mono-white life gain, devotion, the Johnny's pride mates with the Johnny and Heliod, and you just get these huge bears, and then they just punch her, bear cats, whatever, and you just punch your opponent in the face, and everything is fantastic. So, in that deck, this serves as an extra protection thing. Also, it is itself an enchantment creature, so it's nice that, I guess you could use this to protect other ones, but largely it'll help trigger your constellations very cheaply. And the effect is also very cheap to use, you just have to have one mana up available, which usually you can end the turn, even if you play optimally, with like, you know, one or two mana floating around. Two mana is kind of tricky, usually you have to plan on having two mana. One mana, okay, I just haven't had one mana. So that's where this thing can be very, very nice, and the fact that it has a lifelink means you can also jump block and not really feel too bad about it. Not too shabby, I think you might see like a couple of these, um, think of it almost as like a white pseudo counter spell, an extra god's willing that might trigger something else, but... Yeah, and you just use this for the fact that it gives you devotion as well, whereas God's Willing is just a little, um, you know, cycle through card that only really sees play with Feather. All right, going forward. But yeah, I like this card. Going forward, I don't know what the... There, there's the right button. Archon of Sun's Grace. It's a 4 minute 3-4 lifelink flyer. So that alone is very nice. 4 minute 3-4 flyer itself would be playable. Yeah, with lifelink on top of it? Okay, yeah, we're, we're not too shabby. Pegasus creatures you control have lifelink. Worth noting, this is not a Pegasus. This is an Archon. I would have been very upset by that, but since it has Archon in the name, I'll let it slide. But next time, Wizards, watch out. Um, so, the Constellation is whenever an enchantment creature, not creatures, any enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, you make a 2-2 white Pegasus creature with flying. So, my Pegasus token, if that's not obvious. So, that is a pretty strong effect, not gonna lie. If you get to play this and then untap and play like an enchantment or two or something. Uh, maybe you play one of the sagas, maybe you play a buff thing, maybe you just go back and you play this guy just to protect your Archon. You just start spinning out two twos for free, basically. Even on its own, if you're playing against this, any sort of aggro deck, this will make them use some sort of more targeted, more annoying removal against it. And if you have any sort of protection for it, then they're gonna, you know, you're gonna get like almost a two for one for that. And once you start spitting out the Pegasus creatures and just swinging in the air and getting all the life back, you're going to be pretty well off. Um, in Limited, obviously this card's amazing. In Standard, it could see some play. It's largely, I don't think it's going to make its own deck, but I think it could be like a sideboard thing. Maybe a one or two of in some decks and mostly sideboarded against aggro. I don't think that this thing, you getting a bunch of life and taking to the skies, is really going to do a whole lot. It's very slow for what Azorius Flyers wants to do, which is just punch you in the air really, really quickly, jam down a Safara, and then just keep swinging and they can't really do anything about it. So this, I feel, is a little too slow for that deck, but it could see more play in other, maybe like a mid-range white deck. And you could try to put it in the Devotion as a sideboard thing, because it does have lifelink, so the life gain triggers will matter. 
going forward. Archon, another Archon, of Falling Stars. Six mana, four, four flyer. Okay, I don't love it, but we'll see what it does. When an Archon of Falling Stars dies, you may return target and enchantment card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So there are a few kind of infinite loops you can do with this thing. Um, there's one, not in standard, obviously, where you have this thing and you have the Elder Reborn, uh, the Saga. So you play this, it dies. Uh, previously, you must have had the Elder Reborn out there, whatever, or play the Elder Reborn, whatever the ordering is. You use, when this thing dies, you get the Elder Reborn back in the board. It goes through the sagas, and then for the last trigger, you use it to get, to get back Archon of Falling Stars. And then and this thing dies, you get it back, and you go back and forth. So you can always have one of those two on the board. While that's nice, that's a very kind of slow thing. And I don't think that for six mana, you're going to want to play this thing, whereas you might just want to potentially get something that can escape. Uh, escape is a very strong mechanic. Okay, it kind of seems a little interesting. It's like, well, I'm going to pay a lot of mana and get rid of a lot of cards in my graveyard to replay like one, maybe two, maybe three things in a game. But that's not to be underestimated. Escape is still very, very powerful. So <clears throat> that's worth considering. Therefore, I don't think that this is going to see much play just because it costs so much. If it was cheaper and it did, even if it was like target enchantment, like three or less, then I could see that seeing a lot more play because there's probably a few things you can recur easily that way. But being the cost that it is, and it has to die at the same time, you can't just sacrifice it somehow. I mean, you can, but it doesn't have it built into the creature. I feel like this isn't actually going to see any play. In limited, though, it's a 4-4 four, four flyer for six. If you want to go on top of things, you can. If you have a really strong enchantment, like, I don't know, that's the best the sea god or whatever the heck it is, then, or if you just have... How the hell are you going to have a god in the graveyard? I guess you mill it. Um, then, yeah, you could try that. Otherwise, maybe try to find something a little more sturdy, a little more impactful. All right, we have a three mana Banishing Light. It is an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, exile, target, and non land permanent, and opponent controls until this leaves the battlefield. So it's another one of those sort of like uh, Oblivion Ring, O Ring effects, uh, you know, a binding of Ixlan, Ixlan's binding, whatever it is. Another one of those glass casket kind of things, too. Where, you know, it's here, your thing's gone, and then when this thing leaves, it comes back. The fact that it's an enchantment is very, very significant because it works towards your devotion. And the fact that it exiles is obviously very important in this set because the gods are indestructible. So that's literally, you know, it kind of had to say that, otherwise it's easier to play. But, that being said, uh, yeah, it's a very... Good card to have. It's definitely going to see some standard play. I almost guarantee you. Um, Glass Casket doesn't really see much play, but it has a narrow window of things you can use it on. Prison Realm sees a little bit of play, and that only hits uh, creatures and planeswalkers. The fact that this is any non-land permanent could be very, very significant. That would mean that it can hit... I don't know if your opponent, for some reason, left an Ember Cleave out. They're just chilling. If they have... Um, obviously not like a Nissa, but if they have... Uh, the Great Henge, or just anything that's really, really kind of grinding down on you, then drop this thing down, and it does what you want it to do. Um, it is outclassed by Prison Realm? The fact... Uh, I think the fact that it says non-land permanent, you can probably side this in, games like 2 and 3, after your opponent sides in things, because they might have, like, Sorcerer's Spyglasses or something. Usually, your opponent might be siding in artifacts or enchantments to counter your stuff. Therefore, having this as a response to those could be good. Uh, in limited, it's good if your opponent has any kind of gods. It can largely remove whatever the hell you want it to. So, solid card there. All right, captivating unicorn, uh, five mana, four four. Not good at all. Uh, constellation, whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, tap target creature and opponent controls. I I'm not really a huge fan of that. I think that's called like a lower effect when you just tap something. I don't know, but either way, just. It's trying to do some sort of like Gadwick effect almost. I'm not really a huge fan of that. I think that's also like what Starcrown Stag did back in the day, but it could be wrong. So just no, there are better options. Um, in Limited, you can try to run it, but it's a little slow. A 5 minute 4 4. That might tap things if it gets anywhere. It seems like it's not really going to get a whole lot done. In Standard, it shouldn't see any play at all. In Constructed, it shouldn't see any play at all. Commanding Presence. 4 mana Enchantment Aura. Uh, you have to. Put it on a creature, because sometimes you enchant players, but this is a creature. Uh, it gets plus two, plus two, and has first strike, and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, you make a 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature token. No life link, worth noting. So see, so for three mana, plus two, plus two, and first strike, and they're going to want to block it. Otherwise, you get a 1-1 one, one token. I don't really know if a 1-1 one, one token is all that significant. And I don't... It's a big investment, 
the one of the big drawbacks to auras are that you're asking to make, to get two for one because if they destroy the creature, they destroy the creature and the aura, and that's two for one if they just use a generic kill spell. Shira protects it a lot in combat, but I don't believe that that's really enough to make up for it. And the payoff is that whenever you deal combat damage to a player, you make a 1-1 one, one token. It doesn't even help your devotion at all. I don't like this card at all. Um, in limited, even I don't think that's great, because if your opponent is somewhat aware, if it seems like you're trying to keep some things up there, they might just have a kill spell for it, and it feels really bad when maybe you make a 1-1 one, one and deal some damage to your opponent, and then they kill that in your creature, and you still 2-for-1, because a 1-1 one, one token is really worth much. Nah. Dawn Evangel, 3-mana 2-3. When, as an enchantment creature, with noting that whenever a creature dies, if an aura you controlled was attached to it, return target creature card with CMC, two or less, from your graveyard to your hand. If it was a graveyard to the battlefield, this card would be fantastic. It does have the fact that it's an enchantment creature, so it um, triggers other constellation effects. And a 3 mana 2 3 body, not great, but it's better being a 2 3 than a 3 2 at that mana cost in particular, so that you can at least block like a few things. But. <clears throat> Whenever a creature dies, if an aura you controlled was attached to it, it's trying to remove some of the downside to having auras and being two for one in that way. But you doesn't you don't even put the card back on the board. You put the creature into your hand. You just have to replay it next turn. It can't be a big creature. I don't feel like this is actually going to see any play anywhere. No, not a fan. Not a fan. If it was onto the board, yes. But since it's just back into your hand, just like what's that like a disentomb effect? No. Okay, Daxos Blessed by the Sun. So every color has not only their own god, but their own demigod, like a champion for their uh, for their color, for their pantheon that the god has decided. And they all have something to do with devotion. I think they all also cost double of that color. So, you know, white, white, blue, blue, whatever. So who is Daxos? Who, not Daxos. Who is Heliod's champion? That is Daxos. Uh, the toughness is equal to your devotion to white. So it is a two... X comes out at at least a 2-2 two, two, uh, for 2. Usually, not usually, but usually in the game it'll get buffed up to like a 2-3, 2-4, just 3-year devotion increasing, which is pretty strong for 2 mana. And then the effect is whenever another creature you control enters the battlefield or dies, you gain 1 life. So this is that whole like Soul Warden kind of cleric effect where, but it triggers on both, which is very nice, because a lot of them only trigger on the first enter the battlefield thing. There's a couple that do when it dies. Since this is like double dipping on that whole thing, this is fantastic. It's got a really significant body. You gain a bunch of life, twice as much as you normally would from similar effects. And not only that, but it helps a lot with your devotion and it helps trigger the life gain effects. This card is super solid. I think this will definitely see play in standard and in limited too. Huh? Why the hell not? I don't know. Just gain some more life, maybe pad your life a little. And if nothing, it's going to be a solid blocker if you're just playing mono white. Even if you have one more thing out there, a two, three for two that can gain some life is good daybreak chimera is a five minute three three flyer and it has affinity for devotion to white basically it costs x less to cast or x is your devotion to white so let's consider this best case scenario it's a two minute three three flyer which is good but seeing as you're never going to play this on turn two because you're not going to have three devotion after turn one Three Devotion to White after turn one. Not so great. So it's a card that wants to be fast, but isn't actually being fast at all. Sure, you could play this in a Flyers deck and have a bunch of the other creatures out there, have the Archon, or just have a whole bunch of Healer Talks, and maybe like Empyrean Eagles, and this makes it a lot cheaper, which is good, but the decks there already do pretty well. I guess I could see that coming into play. In fact, the more I talk about it, the more I like it, but then if you think about the other side of this, a uh, 5-mana 3-3 three, three Flyer, Oh boy, that definitely doesn't like feel good at all. So you might see like one of these <laughs> in an Azorius Flyer deck, someone trying it out, and I think I, eventually they're just going to cut it anyway for something they worth a little bit more. Uh, if you're playing this in limited, it could be decent just because flyers are nice, having some sort of evasion, but still just a 3-3 body isn't all that much to be interested about and a 3-3 for 5 you have to consider the worst case scenario the the floor on this card is fairly low so I would still say not excited at all if it was an enchantment creature maybe it's not now we have a 3 mana dreadful apathy do I just read cards from like right to left I don't know maybe I do it is an enchantment aura and the enchanted creature can't attack or block 
And you can also pay three to exile the enchanted creature. So how does this compare to pacifism, which we haven't seen for a little while, which is just two mana enchanted creature can't attack or block? Well, you pay one more mana, which is significant. It is definitely worth noting. Like going from one mana to two mana is huge. And that's like a big gap. Going from like five to six isn't so much of a huge thing, but still, and I'm just saying like generically adding one mana after the first couple turns isn't really a big deal. However, like hacking on this extra, you can exile the enchanted creature effect doesn't really strike me as being horribly important. I think you could have like just gotten rid of that and made it cost two and reprinted pacifism and we'd be fine with that. But they didn't want to reprint pacifism. It's fine and limited. You can use it to get rid of something. And if you have to, if the creature has some sort of ability because it doesn't have abilities that you want to get off the board, then I guess you have to invest three more mana to get rid of that. Which doesn't seem worth it. Um, I'd rather just run a kill spell if possible. Um, and in limited, this shouldn't see any. In, no, in standard, this shouldn't see any play at all because pacif pacifism effects don't really work. You'd rather just get the thing out the board with something like Conclave Tribunal. That's what we do right now. And even that costs four, worst case scenario, and still sees play. This shouldn't see any play in standard. In constructed, I should say. Now we have a two mana Eidolon of Obstruction. We have an enchantment creature, another enchantment. It is a two one with first strike. I'm, don't I don't really love the one there. First strike is nice, but it still trades with fervent champion, which is a one drop. All right, what the rest does it do? Uh, loyalty abilities of planeswalkers, your opponent's control cost one more to activate. So that's interesting. I guess if your opponent has a little planeswalker, then they have to actually pay mana to play the abilities, which is okay. It slows them down a little bit, but even then, I guess if they want to play their Planeswalkers on curve, because this is really cheap, then they can't use the ability right away. Which is a very big thing to consider. However, how many Planeswalkers do we really see going? This is usually just a fairy, uh, which is fine. I just don't think the 2 1 first strike body is going to be all that significant. It's statted aggressively. Um, just with a 2-1 first strike, and then it has a control effect on it, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So I think this card's trying to do a little few, one too many things. I think the best, at best, is going to see some sideboard play against maybe Super Friends decks, if there's any Super Friends decks going around. I mean, Jeskai Walkers was a thing for a little while. You could try to bring that back. I don't really see that happening, though. Because largely, a lot of Planeswalkers are going to be replaced with gods. People are going to try out gods a lot more, and planeswalkers might kind of fall to the wayside. The new one, Calyx, is trash. Ashiok is okay. Elspeth, uh, we'll see. So, I think that the ability might be a little bit too late. Maybe this was supposed to be their answer to Oko, um, because this comes out on turn two, and <laughs> we already answered Oko. He's behind. Huzzah! So, other than it just being a two drop enchantment creature that is a little bit stronger in combat, I don't really see the planeswalker effect being all that useful. Oh, do we want to say in limited? I mean, a two mana two on first strike is pretty good. It's not bad. If you can just get a stronger creature, just do that. Like, don't force this. I wouldn't first pick this thing ever. But, eh. Okay, Elspeth Conquers Death. We have our first saga. A five mana uh, saga with three chapters. Chapter one Exile Target Permanent among the trolls. With the permanent cost three or greater. So this is coming down on turn 5, and it can exile basically the biggest threat your opponent has. Um, there is one further up the line that exiles things that are like 2 or less. I mean, it exiles but destroys. Which is very, very strange. I think it costs 3 to play. It's like, I really don't want to play this later on and have it not have any targets for the first chapter. And this one will usually have a target. And it will usually be a pretty significant target as well. The fact that it's a permanent, not a creature, means that it can get rid of other enchantments, obviously you can get rid of gods, other sagas even, so that's pretty sweet. Chapter 2, non-creature spells your opponent's cast cost two more to cast until your next turn. Okay, so this is largely just protecting the saga, I guess, and also stopping your opponent from board wiping. So if you were trying to swarm the board and then you play this on 5, it could be like a curve topper, potentially. Let's see where else it goes. Return target creature or planeswalker card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Put a possible plus one counter on it, or a loyalty counter if it's a planeswalker. Well, that is a very nice thing. So they basically just got the Elders Reborn, flipped it on his head, and said you still get a creature because white can bring things back to life too. Um, really, really nice card. I actually really like this card a lot. This could probably see play as like a two, probably not a three of, maybe even a three of, who the hell knows. Um, it's not a legendary saga or anything, so you can actually have a couple of them on the board. Are there legendary sagas? I don't know. Um, although I think there's one where you can be your commander, it's, it's weird. 
<clears throat> but let's see. The first ability is very nice. It just exiles it forever. Even if this thing goes away, it still stays gone. The chapter two thing doesn't really do a whole lot. This that is best against obviously decks that aren't running as many creatures, which would mean it's largely a control deck. Therefore, exiling still matters. Probably chapter one is going to hit either enchantment or a maybe a god, maybe a planeswalker. And chapter three cannot bring back the target. Let's see, this is only from your graveyard. Okay, not from your opponent's graveyard either. So, still pretty good. I think I really like this card. I think it'll be like a two, two of, maybe sideboard a third copy in standard sort of things. In limited, hell yeah. Just throw that in there, recur whatever creature you want to. Again, the second chapter isn't really going to do too much, but in limited, people do have a fair mix of creatures and um, non creature spells usually, so it'll force them to play a few things. Lovely, lovely. Ah, here's Elspeth herself, the sun's nemesis. For four mana, you get a loyalty of five. The first ability is minus one. Up to two target creatures you control. Each get plus two plus one until end of turn. Not a huge fan of that. It's an aggressive ability. That's okay. I'm not really used to Elspeth being so aggressive. It's usually block things and then destroy things and then block more things and gain some life. All right, well, do we go from there? Minus two. Create two one one white human soldier creature tokens. That's a very Elspeth thing to do. You make tokens. Okay, cool. I'm on board with that. You do that, you make two tokens. Fine. All right, nothing wrong with that. And the big ulti, the huge ability, minus three. Gain five life. That's it. Um, so, as it stands, I mean, you could obviously proliferate this thing or use some other ability, Johnny the Great Hearted, if you wanted to, the, the one from War of the Spark, or what else is there? Obviously, it said proliferate. If you bring it back with this, it'll have an extra load to counter on it. <laughs> very, very thematic there. Um, the big thing with this is that it has an escape. You can escape for six, and you exile four of the cards from your graveyard, and you replay it, which, that being said, is pretty nice. Unfortunately, I think that this card suffers from not having a clear direction. The second two, the second two abilities there are, or actually the last two, what, are supposed to be like protective. You're not gonna minus two to be aggressive. You don't want to do that for four mana, or worse for six mana. You want to do something else for four or six mana, like make a bigger creature or more tokens or whatever. And let's see, the gain five life. I mean, four mana gain five, and then you still have one loyalty left over, or well, two loyalty left over. Eh, I guess the idea is that you minus two, make a blocker, block with one or two of the guys, then gain five life, and then you escape her later on. And the first one's very aggressive. I don't see this seeing a whole lot of play. Uh, in limited, sure, go for it, because it's infinite tokens, infinite life if you want to. If you have enough cards to exile, you're not going to have that many cards to exile, trust me. Um, you, could re you could probably only feasibly replay her once, maybe twice. So, yeah. I actually don't like Elspeth. The favorite of Iroas, a 3 mana, 2-2. Two, two. Don't like it, okay. Whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, it gets double strike until the turn. Uh, no, 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 it's not that good. I mean, you could try to get this with a buff as well, and you could put enchantment buffs on it, but it's only for the end of turn. It's not, it doesn't have trample, you can try to give it trample, but again, it's just, you're going to try to be devoting a lot to trigger this thing for no real good reason. I don't think the payoff is that good. So, negative in all fronts. All right, Flicker of Fate, a two-minute instant. Exile target creature or enchantment, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. So, I actually really like this card quite a bit. Not only does it obviously get to you, get you to replay abilities that just have enter the battlefield things, you can use it with Banishing Light if there's a better target out there. Okay, I'm going to Flicker my Banishing Light, and then I'm gonna, you get your thing back, but I'm going to target something else now. Which is more significant. You can obviously also trigger things like Charming Prince, or well, that's has its own flicker thing if you wanted to. Um, you know, Fenlurker, or what else? Risen Reef, I guess, if you wanted to. You know, any of those sort of ETB things, which would be nice. On top of that, you can use this as pseudo, like a pseudo counter spell. Your opponent has a shock in hand, and they're going to shock your creature. Okay, Flicker of Fate. It basically fills with the shock. Using two mana and stuff a one mana spell, not ideal. So maybe something a little more significant would matter. Um, you can use it in response to your opponent trying to murder rider or something. And then the target's gone, and then the murder rider can't be played from exile because it goes to the graveyard because there was no target when it tried to resolve. That's pretty significant. Um, basically destroying a murderous rider there is like a hell of a two for one, I don't know. I would call it a two for one. Because you get a swift end and murderous rider in one shot. And you save your creature. 
Yeah, I like this card a bit. Will it actually see play though? I think you might see like one or two of these, but you're yeah, gonna have to have a deck that actually can really capitalize off of it. You can't count on your opponent running into this thing as a counter. You have to actually build around it. And because of that, we have to consider are the build around decks for it all that good? At the moment, they're not. So, unfortunately, I don't think this is gonna be enough to push them into that area. I do like the card, I just don't think it's gonna be enough for a competitive play. In limited, I don't think this card is going to be good at all, just because it's hard to build those kind of synergies. It's very, very unreliable. So due to that, I don't think it's uh, worth trying to make this work. We have Glory Bearers. Four mana, three, four. Bad. Whenever another creature you control attacks, it gets plus zero, plus one till end of turn. The only thing this really has going for it is that it's an enchantment creature. And if that's all it is, then I don't like it. Straight up, the little bonus toughness there is largely irrelevant. Yeah, but what if everything I had had bonus toughness? It's only when they attack. It doesn't even work on the defense if you want to play like a more turtley strategy. When you block, it doesn't get any buff. So, no. Get out of here. Bad, bad, and more bad. Okay. Every god has their own intervention, which has an X in the mana cost. This is Hilia's intervention. This is how he intervenes. He's, he's intervening. So, for X and white, white. You get an instant, choose to either destroy X target artifacts and or enchantments, instant speed, not bad, like a shattering spree sort of thing, or target player gains twice X life. A lot of these also have the twice X thing, I think they all do, um, which is very interesting. This immediately reminds me of Sanguine Sacrament, um, although I could shuffle back into your library afterwards, but that was like a traditional sideboard card for control decks playing against aggro you would either fetch it with masterminds acquisition or just side it in usually you leave it for masterminds and then that's like okay you got me down to like three life hopefully not three life because shock was still in play not shock but which is lightning <laughs> and lightning strike were very real cards um but you know got me down to like four or five and then saying the sacrament or heal as intervention and x equals five i heal for ten suddenly you're got it you bought yourself a few returns the fact that artifacts are very very prevalent in the form of <laughs> witch's oven yes i was gonna say witch's cat oven familiar thing yeah um to a lesser degree the great henge uh lucky clover does see some play here and there uh, obviously fires of invention is the big one and now we're gonna see a lot more enchantments because of this thing i think this card is very very good it doesn't say it has to be non-creature enchantment so this can also just be straight up like kill spells i see nothing wrong with this card i think this card is fantastic i love it and in i mean i think if you open this in limited you're gonna play it it's just it's so versatile and the fact that it's modal if it was just one if it was like a card that had one thing just like a short extra artifacts or enchantments no i'd consider that too narrow if it was just life gain i'd say okay only in these specific cases not really worth it in limited but the fact that it is in both you had the option of cho choosing either one it's fantastic Three mana for a one, two Heliod's Pilgrim. Whenever Heliod's Pilgrim enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an aura card, reveal it, put it into your hand, and shuffle your library. So, three mana for a one, two. I gotta say two, one. I don't know if I said two, one, but I meant one, two if I misspoke. That's horrible. That is absolutely garbage. So, the aura you're getting has to be really, really good. The fact that it has to be an aura and not just any enchantment means this card is really, really bad. Maybe there's some other stuff in like other formats, modern, legacy, who knows? I mean, vintage, sure, there's gotta be something where there's like this super crazy, you know, insane aura that maybe even comes down on turn four that just wins you the game. I don't know. But in current standard, I don't think there's anything that this is really worth playing for. I would rather just throw something else in there to put in a solid creature, put in some kind of blocker. Maybe use Idealic Tutor. I know I'm looking into the future a little bit here, even though I don't think that's a great card either. The fact that it's only an aura card makes it not so good. Uh, and yeah, in limited, I don't think you can afford playing a three mana one two at a card to your hand spell. You just basically pass the turn at that point, and that is hard to come back from. All right, oh, boy. Talked about pacifism, right? So Helios Punishment is a two-mana aura. Enters the battlefield with four task counters on it. The enchanted creature can't attack or block, and it loses all abilities. At least it loses all the abilities. That's something that has some value to it. Although, <laughs> it gains the ability to remove the task counters, and when they're all gone, 
then his punishment's over, and hey, he's he's paid for his crimes, and he's he's good, and he's fine. You know, he's, it's okay. You, you, you did your time for the crime, and now we're all happy again. No, 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 no. I mean, I guess you could try this in limited if you're trying to like. If you reach a standstill, if you think you can really rush down your opponent pretty quickly, you just put this on whatever creatures is in the way, and then you continually try to smack them in the face, but over the course of the next few turns, that creature's gonna come right back. And then you feel really bad playing a, what, a two-mana, maybe deal three or four life. Deal three or four damage to your opponent. That's it. Not, not worth it there. And constructed zero play. Zero play ability. Absolutely. None. Ah! And here is, the, you see the, you see the, has anyone seen my son? Yeah, uh, right here. It's funny, because, because, because son. Anyway, um, heal the sun crowned. The god has arrived. Three mana, five, five. They're all going to be indestructible. And we need devotion at least five or greater. Or heal the is not a creature. It's just an enchantment hanging around. Um, obviously, it counts itself towards devotion, so we have to have four more of the things. Probably not going to be able to have that by turn three. Technically, you could... I don't know how you could. Because, like, turn one, you play a, you know, any white creature. Anyone, like, one drop, you have one. Turn two, you can play Daxos. Okay, you have three devotion now. Turn three, Heliod. And you have four devotion. Turn five, you turn him on, and he's already been there. Okay, it's not really too bad. I actually turn four, not turn five. But what's really nice, <laughs> which um, a lot of people are concerned about in other formats, is that first ability there, whenever you gain life, Put a plus one plus one counter on target creature or enchantment you control. So, the fact that Walking Ballista exists <laughs> means that this card is part of a two card OTK in any format where they're both legal. <laughs> I just put it that way. More so in Modern and Pioneer, because there aren't as many answers, I'd say. <laughs> um... In those formats versus, like, Legacy, which, obviously, you know, there's just more cards involved. So a lot of people are concerned about that because if you have a Walking Ballista with at least two counters on it and you have Heliod down there, you can use Heliod's last ability. Um, you can give something lifelink till the end of turn. And then if you put that in the Ballista, it deals damage to your opponent's face. Because of that, it has lifelink. <laughs> because that has lifelink, uh, you gain some life. Because you gain life, you put a counter back on Ballista. So you lose a counter, gain a counter, lose a counter, gain a counter, and all the time your opponent takes damage. And also you gain life, just because you can get a bunch of life that way. So, yeah, that is something to just be on the lookout for. A lot of people probably already talked about it. Um, just something to be aware of. Beyond that, though, first off, let me just say, any god that you get in limited, you take it, you run it, you hope that you can like, keep it on the board, and that's it. There, there's really no question about it. In Constructed, this card is similarly amazing, because it costs 3. Even though it doesn't actually do a whole lot, the turn it comes down. Although it can, because if you have anything like, you know, any lifelinkers, any healers, hawks, anything like that, then you can definitely just make use of a second ability. But second, I mean first. But, uh, make use of the counter ability. But usually, turn 4, you should be able to trigger him. Turn four, turn five. He's not going to be sitting dormant for very long. So because of that, I think that this is potentially the best god of this cycle, of this set. Back in the day, it was Thassa. Love Thassa. Represent blue. Right now, I think this is kind of what they're doing to... Oh, hold on. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I think this is like their constellation being, hey, listen, white, I know we kind of didn't give you a whole lot of help here. So here's a god that actually gets things done. Cool. Lovely card. Fantastic. All right, two mana, two, two. Okay, so we got a bear, as they're called. Hero of the Pride. Whenever you cast a spell that targets Hero of the Pride, creatures you control get plus one, plus zero, and tell them to turn. No, I don't like it. I mean, okay, in standard, it sees a zero play. And in limited, you can try to do it, because there's a two, two, two mana, two, two with upside, potentially. How often are you going to play a spell that targets... It has to target this, which is a little interesting. Um, it's going to be a decent removal target there. I mean, there's nothing wrong with playing a two mana, two, two. Exactly, but I wouldn't really go to I wouldn't go out of my way to put this in your deck. Maybe as like a I mean you're in 40 cards in the deck. Maybe as like a 35th card or something. If you're looking for like a few more things to play early game, sure. Otherwise, don't think this is gonna be your big closeout thing. I'm gonna buff all my creatures in the swing. If you have that many creatures to buff, you're probably already winning. If you aren't winning, there's some other problem you have to address. And then we have a four mana version of the same damn thing. <laughs> uh it's a one-four flyer. Hero of the Winds. 
and it has the same effect when you spell cast a spell that targets this creatures you control get plus one plus zero absolutely zero playability here at least this was a two mana two two at worst this is a four mana one four horrible card will not see any play should not see any play moving on idyllic tutor that's the one i mentioned earlier so a three mana sorcery search your library for an enchantment card reveal it put it into your hand maybe that giant hand over there maybe the little tiny hand i don't know whose hand is whose and um shuffle the library so unfortunately because of the speed of standard right now three mana do nothing basically if you're playing this on curve is a whole lot to invest into passing the turn um which is very very unfortunate and because of that probably wouldn't see play save for if you're playing fires if you're playing fires and you need to you know you want some more access to fires because they already play all the sphinxes and whatnot and all the shimmers just to get to fires of invention so if you just want to have some more reliability you put this in there it curves directly into it three mana into a four mana of fires and then you play you know your cavalcade not cavalcade you play your definitely clarion if you need to or maybe a sphinx or some other four drop that you like i don't know but that is the, really the only case i could see this seeing a decent amount of play you can try to play this in limited i wouldn't because what you're searching for is probably a little too close to its own cost or might need a creature on the board and if you're giving up a turn and hoping a creature survives to put an aura on it or something like that then it's not that great maybe if you have one of the bigger like sagas where you have multiple effects going off you can recoup the value there otherwise the tempo loss is going to be too severe so i really only see the scene play in fires decks they're good but that's one deck one deck archetype okay two mana indomitable will it is a flash aura and the enchanted creature gets plus one plus two so i really like the fact that it has flash because that means it gets rid of a lot of it gets rid of all the sorcery speed removal to get rid of that two for one sort of thing that you get with auras that are just inherent to i play this at the top of a creature if the creature dies they both die two for one right so the fact that it dodges that at least for a little while is still vulnerable to instant speed removal is nice um this, this is going to see zero standard play, first off. No play in standard. Um, if you really just want to drop enchantments, there's the one thing that gives us... One too many enchantment. I think it's like Angelic Wings or whatever. That gives a creature flying and draws you a card. That'll see more play if this like if that's what you're looking for. Because it draws you a card, it triggers your enchantment stuff. Um, and that's zero play anyway. I don't think that card is going to be much better because of the set. Maybe. That'd be sweet. Um, I think it's like Angel's Gift, maybe. I don't know what it's called. Um, in limited, you could try. It's an interesting little combat trick there. I like that it buffs the toughness, so, you know, yeah, at least you got that going for you. Instead of, you're more likely to get one over on your opponent instead of just trading afterwards, so you have that, but I think there are better options. We have Chirometra's Blessing, one mana instant. Okay, I like this. Oh, look at that. It's a, is that an elk? Oh, it's, it's, it's too soon. Too soon. No. No, Oka, why? <laughs> Target creature gets plus two, plus two in another turn. If it's an enchanted creature or enchantment creature, it also gains hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. This card's good. I don't know how often things are going to be enchanted, but if it's an enchantment creature, now we're talking. You can use this on any of the demigods' work, obviously any of the gods as well, although they already have indestructible, so hexproof is really going to be the only thing you're adding to it. But the fact that it's basically... A one mana white counter spell that also buffs your creature is fantastic. Um, certainly, you want to play this in limited. You're probably going to see some having some play in standard too. Um, the hexproof is really going to be the reason why. Indestructible is pretty good, but I feel like hexproof is actually a lot more reliable here, a lot more important, just because of the ability to target a god and actually get more upside. Sure, the indestructible goes to waste, but the rest is still very significant so yes great card watch out for it if your opponent just keeps up that one white mana for whatever reason this might be why we have a four mana three four eh, okay uh lagana band storyteller lagona hmm. when lagana band storyteller enters the battlefield you may put target enchantment card from your graveyard on top of your library if you do you gain some life 
I hate that effects. I hate effects that put cards on top of your library. Like, even... There's a few tutors that you play, and like, vintage or whatever, that put cards on top of your library. At least with those, you also have a crap load of card draws, so you just basically draw at the same turn, and keep going through. But, oh, this card I just feel like is so bad. And it also has to be from your graveyard, too, so it's probably not gonna be all that valuable. Like, it can't be a god, really, unless you mill one somehow, because they're gonna be in exile if they removed it all, so that's not gonna work. Nope. I hate this card. I hate it. Both, all formats is gone. Alright, two mana, three, one. Uh, when it dies, exile target card from an opponent's graveyard. It's fine. You can see you playing, like, maybe one of these in a sealed thing. Or in a limited format. Just as a three, one. Just as something that can maybe trade up a little bit. Uh, standard zero play. But... Maybe one. I don't know. If you have a better option, you're gonna put a better option in there. The exile thing is nice. Otherwise, it's just like the it's like the lean and switch pull, whatever the heck the thing is, or Oscarus, whatever the heck the one is. That's like two mana three one. Um, it has slight upside, which could be somewhat valuable. But other than that, I wouldn't put more than one in any sort of limited deck and zero in standard. Three mana two four next point courser. Pack failure thing. It's an enchantment creature. It's got that going forward. Otherwise, if you need something around three mana, if you really need that devotion to white in limited, maybe you go ahead, try it. Again, no more than one. Standard zero play. Limited maybe just for your devotion. Or if you have a lot of constellation effects, sure. Otherwise, it doesn't exactly fit your curve so well. Ah! Each god has an omen, and Heliod's omen is perfect hair. I'm working on it, okay? <laughs> So, 3 mana flash enchantment, when it enters the battlefield, you make 2 one, one white human creature, human, well, yeah, soldier creature tokens, and you gain 2 life. And then the second ability on each omen is the same, you do 2 and 1 of that color, and you sacrifice the omen, you scry 2. Each omen has the same effect at the bottom, save for the uh, color difference. So, what we're really looking at here is flash it in for 3 mana, make 2 tokens, and gain 2 life. I like that effect. I think that effect is worth it. If it was just one or the other, obviously if it was just three mana gain two life, no. We have two mana gain two life, or at least we had, I don't know if it's still in standard, in Revitalize, which saw some play, and hasn't seen play for a while, probably cycled out, I think, I don't know, I don't really care. Um, <laughs> the fact that you're making tokens and gaining life, and if you already have Heliod out there, and you're gaining life, then you can add counters to your creatures, that's great. The synergy here is fantastic. Um, you Unfortunately, there might be other cards that kind of outshine it. In Limited, I like it. It just makes you two creatures and stuff, and you can use it as like surprise blocker, you know, kill, basically deal two damage to a creature. Cool. The fact that you can scry two with it later on, cool. I don't really value the scry two part of these omens, by the way, like at all, in standard in constructed decks, because you really don't want to pay three mana for that sort of effect. So it's nice that it's there. If you're in like top deck wars or something, you can do this and maybe try to filter a few things through. But otherwise, it's largely irrelevant. But you can do it during your opponent's turn too. I could see this in like a mono white devotion deck if you want to sideboard this in against aggression to have like f blockers that come in instant speed as well as life gain in the same thing. That'd be great. If the format is very, very aggressive, this could be even a main board card. Otherwise, you might want to hold off on this a little bit and just maybe try running one and see how well, how nice it feels. <laughs> How's that feel? Alright. Moving on. We have Phalanx Tactics. A 2-mana instant target creature you control gets plus 2 plus 1 during a turn. Each other creature you control gets plus 1 plus 1 during a turn. So kind of a charge effect. Uh, they never really see a whole lot of play in standard. You usually want to do other effects. Right now, we already have Unbreakable Formation, which is... I would say just strictly better. Um, therefore, I wouldn't really bother with it. If you want to, you could try one of these in limited as like an alpha strike kind of thing. I wouldn't bother with it though. Maybe as a 39th card or a 40th card, not even like in the first like half of your deck. I wouldn't. I would completely dismiss this card. So no. All right, we have Pious Wayfarer. Uh, one mana, two, one two, one mana, one two, with constellation whatever and enchantment into the battlefield under control. Target creature gets a little buff until the turn. It's plus almost one. Well, this is a one mana one two. It's got that going for it, but the constellation effect fills it out into the turn. It's not very significant. I don't like this at all. 
Um, so no, I think it'll see zero play in standard and probably zero play in limited as well. Or like probably some play because people are going to play it anyway, but it's not worth it. I didn't say the people were good. <laughs> I didn't say I was good. So exactly. Grain of salt. Okay. Just, just pour the salt on that one. Okay. A five mana one, two. God, that ability had better be good because five mana one, two feels really bad. When it enters the battlefield, create a number of one, one white human soldier creature tokens equal to your devotion to white. That ability is probably a lot better than you think it is. If you think it's already really good, then yes. But if you don't think it's really good, it's really good. By the time you get to five mana, like if this was like a cheap thing, it would actually probably be overpowered because if you could just drop it for like one or two and suddenly spawn like five tokens, which is kind of ideally what you want to do. You want to get at least like, you know, four or five one ones. If it was spawn like summon three, it would be pretty bad. But the fact that you're probably going to get four or five or maybe even more makes this card very, very nice. And therefore, I do like it. I don't know. In mono white decks and limited, this should definitely see play. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't see any play. I would put that in like the top 10 maybe for white, which isn't going to be a whole lot because there's not a whole lot of white cards in the set, right? But I would put that definitely in like top tier white premium. I want to get this card. Um, in standard, I don't think because it's so expensive and it's very it's a very aggressive card, I don't think it'll see too much play. You might see one or two at the high end of things, but other than that, I think there's going to be faster options that deal a similar amount of damage. But I still think it's a very, very good card. Okay, ah, two mana revoke, revoke existence. Sure, you get your white, um, just removal for gods, basically. Exile, target artifact, or enchantment. Solid card. I think this is a reprint from the old Theros. If not, then sue me, I guess. I don't know why you would sue me. I don't know on what grounds, but if you want to give it a shot, then please don't, because I, I don't have anything to give you. <laughs> not my suit. That's all I have. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but anyway, so two mana, just solid thing. I mean, you would definitely run that limited, and... Depending on how prevalent gods are in standard, you might main deck this thing. I definitely think I'll see some sideboard play for sure. Nothing wrong with this. Nothing at all. Five mana, three six. Not a fan. And enters the battlefield, scry one. That could be largely irrelevant. I mean, the only redeeming thing is that it does have two um, devotion. It does give two devotion to white. So that could be reliable. That could be relevant, rather. And it is, it's got a big body, so it'll probably hang around for a little while. Yeah, it can help stabilize boards. Obviously, standard zero play. Um, in limited, it can help stabilize boards a little bit if you're trying to hit your devotion payoff things. If you don't have any big devotion payoffs, I wouldn't even bother with this card. Or if you don't have any things that are higher up on the ladder um, to play, like higher mana cost, and you don't want to use this thing to stall, then just play a more aggressive card. Play something that wins the game more. This doesn't win the game, it just slows down the game. Ah, now this card. <laughs> this card's interesting. <laughs> Sentinel's Eyes is a one mana aura. A genie creature gets plus one plus one and has vigilance. For one mana, that is not irrelevant. Vigilance is often an overlooked mechanic. Now, I know there's a whole lot of other words on it, but Questing Beast has vigilance. And that's really good because you can be aggressive with it. And you can still block afterwards. It's just overall a stupid creature, and I don't know why it's that strong. It's just a block of text. But ultimately, I think Vigilance is very strong. And the key thing here is the escape thing. Escape for one white, and you exile two other cards. I think that's the cheapest escape that they actually printed. I don't think there are other escape things that cost less, both in combined like a mana cost plus exile cost. I think this is the cheapest one they have. And the fact that you can just do that, and basically every turn, oh, I have one mana floating around, and you probably have two cards in the graveyard. Yeah, I'm going to buff my creature, give it vigilance, so attack you. You know, probably gets through. Okay, cool. Oh, you kill it? Okay. Um, well, I'm going to do a few things, and I'm going to escape it again, and just buff this creature now. I don't see why not. You can even play multiple times at the same turn. I mean, it's just... It's fine. I really like this idea for auras, because it also gets rid of that whole, like, two-for-one two for one in yourself effect on auras. So this card is great in limited. <laughs> in standard, what do we think about this thing? Um, <clears throat> oh boy, I don't think it's good enough in standard. I think it's just too slow. It doesn't really do a whole lot. Unless there's going to be some further down the line escape payoff, like whenever you escape, you deal three damage to your opponent or something, or you, know, you do a whole bunch of nonsense. The fact that it's an enchantment, though, means you can trigger your constellation effects. So... 
if there's any really, really strong constellations, yes. Because this you can just have in the graveyard and just have one mana left over to trigger something. So yeah, actually, you know what? They might be one or two of these in standard. Shatter the Sky. Four mana Wrath, right? Each player who controls a creature with power of four or greater draws a card. Then destroy all creatures. Okay. So the first thing you look at this and say, well, why would I want to destroy my like my board if I had things that are four or greater? So you're probably not going to be drawing a card off this. If you are, it feels kind of bad, but it is what it is. I, I guess at least you replace the creature, right? Maybe. More often than not, you're going to look at this and say, well, I'm destroying a big opponent's creature, but they draw a card. Yeah, but for four mana, if you're not running black and you're not running Kaya's Wrath over this, which is strictly better, then... Strictly better if you don't have anything to draw cards with. Then... This is the best you got. And the best you got isn't all that bad. It's actually a pretty strong effect. I see nothing wrong with not having the slight drawback that your opponent might draw a card. Usually, you're going to want to use this against a wide board. And you don't usually run into too many creatures with power 4 or greater if your opponent's going wide. If they go straight down the middle and try to have like one or two big creatures, then you can use other cards to remove those instead. Uh, let's see now. What do we think about this thing? In limited, is tricky because... You don't usually want to destroy your whole board. Your opponent might see what's going on if you just take a turn or two and don't play any creatures. Maybe you drop an enchantment or two, like an omen or something. But even then, it can kind of turn the tides, but the fact that you're wiping your own stuff too means it might not be the place you want to go. In standard, though, this is going to see some play. I tell you. All right, Sunmaiden Pegasus is a 4-mana 2-3 flyer. Pretty bad on that. Uh, let's see. For 2-mana, it gains Vigilance and Lifelink until the end of turn. No, this card's bad. This card's bad, this card's bad, and it should feel bad. It's a Pegasus for that other Archon, but it already makes Pegasus tokens that are, I don't know, better, I guess. Um, they're not actually better, but it's, this card isn't good. Get out of here. Okay. What have we here? Taranika, a Crow and Veteran. A 3-mana three 3-3 three, three with Vigilance. Yes, okay. What else do you do? Whenever this attacks... Untap another target creature you control. Until I'm to turn, that creature has base power up to 4 4 and gains indestructible. Alright, first off, in limited, this card's a bomb. This card's fantastic. Um, just early game, suddenly you're punching for 7 damage on turn 4, at least. On turn 3, at least, which is like insane. The fact that it also makes your other creature indestructible, so they have to focus on this thing, but then they take 4 at the end of the day and exit vigilance as well. That's, that's great. Oh, it doesn't give vigilance? No, but it untaps it, so you're still attacking with it, so... Yeah. You still you can do that during uh, after you declare attackers, and you can use the ability. So, it's like a pseudo-vigilance on the other creature. Uh, yeah, this card's fantastic. And this will definitely... The fact that it gives two devotion to white also... Ah, yes. In more aggressive white decks in standard that are not going to be so life gain focused, this thing's great. It just takes your little 1-1, one, one, you know, Hunted Witness or whatever, little Healer's Hawk, turns it into a big thing, and makes it unstoppable. It's similar to Gideon, and that is a 3-mana thing that can basically come out as like a 4-4 four, four, and attack and it's indestructible. Very, very similar to that. And I think that's a great effect. Now we have another Saga, 2-mana, The Birth of Melodis. Um, yeah, just taking out the wash. You know, just, you know, some clothes, you know, I got some blankets. So, chapter one. Search your library for a basic planes. And the original reveal for this card, it was in a different language, and people translate it as basic, lang basic land. And like, okay, yeah, cool, multiple colors. No, it is actually just basic planes. Uh, reveal it, put it into your hand, and shuffle your library. So it does not go on the board, but it's not a ramp effect, it just gets you a land, right? Uh, chapter two, you make a zero four wall. Artifact thing with Defender. And then chapter 3, you gain 2 life. This is not to be overlooked. It is actually a very, very effective card against aggressive decks. Wall of Omens was a card that saw quite a bit of play. That was main decked in many control decks because of the fact that it just drew you a card. And it was a big blocker. This doesn't draw you a card. Um, but considering how many times maybe card draw was draw a land. Maybe the top deck card was a land. <laughs> Wall of Omens. Okay, here you go. It's... F strikingly similar even though you have to wait one more turn for the wall to come down and then at the end like usually the big like finale of the saga is supposed to be really showy and everything you just gain two life it feels a little lackluster the biggest part of this is probably the wall but the fact that it comes down earlier could also be a good thing so i actually really like this card 
Um, and I think it will see some play in standard and even in uh, limited. I think you could play like one of these, maybe, and not feel too bad about it. Two of them, you might feel too bad. The three, no, stop. What are you doing? You're not playing white like you want to. Okay. Transcendent Envoy. A two mana one two flyer or a spells you cast cause one less to cast. So if the card if this card is good, it's gonna be really good. The fact that it's already an enchantment and it increases the playability of other enchantments is significant. However, a two mana one two flyer is also easily somewhat easily killed. Killed off. There's not a whole lot of protection it has for itself. So be careful with that. However, if you're playing Aura, like tribal, like that with the I think it's the Starfield Mystic where it gets buffed or you gain some life or whatever whenever an aura does something I, I don't know, um, and just constellation effects. Then you're going to consider playing this card. The fact that it comes down early is very very significant, so you might want to try this card. Like you might even want to do this in four up just because if your constellation effects are that significant, it's a two mana aura, two mana creature that's enchantment, and it can reduce the other cost of things. Uh, in limited, however, I don't think it's worth it because it's just too slow and it easily just gets blocked by something and just completely negated. Um, in standard, you might be able to abuse this a lot more. And I believe the final card here is Triumphant Surge for four mana. Get an instant destroy target creature of power four or greater, and you gain three life. So in limited, yeah, you can play it. Okay, it's removal. Life gain is nice too. It has to destroy a big thing, sure. Standard, it's not going to see any play at all. Like, why would you run this when you could just have the board wipe? Sure, your opponent draws a card, whatever. When you could just have any number of other kill exile spells. So, no, this is not a standard card. In limited, you might run one of these and feel okay about it. If you want any more removal, then just slide. Not slide. Try to run either black, white, or some amount of black or red, or just pick something else. And I believe that is all. Yep, we're back to Allison. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. Please feel free to comment down below. Tell me what you think. Overall, White didn't get too much, but Heliod is fantastic. The Omen of Heliod's pretty good. The Archon's all right, and there's probably something else I'm missing part way through. I was really let down by Elspeth, though. I feel like they could have pushed her a lot more, and they didn't. I also thought she was going to be black, white, and she wasn't, so. Um, oh, Daxos, though. Insane card. Very, very, very good card. Do not underestimate Daxos. So, that being said, like I said before, uh, feel free to comment down below if you if you like what you saw. If you have differing opinions, let me know. Hey, it's okay. I'm not always right. Few people are. <laughs> uh, also, feel free to check out the stream if you want to. Twitch.tv slash bubble thing. I'll put a link down below. And without further ado, I will try my best to get some more of these videos out before the set is fully out, like tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow-ish? Yeah, it's the 15th right now, so tomorrow all right um and without further ado good night or good morning depending on where you are in the world but as always good luck